Welcome. If everybody has found their seats, we can start. I'm very glad that uh, so many of you have found the time to uh, discuss with us today about cultural heritage in a digital Europe on what I've been told is a bank holiday in uh, Belgium. So thanks a lot for you all for coming. Um, we're going to start out with a short um, uh, welcoming remark by my co-host, Mr. Weidenholzer from the SND Group, who unfortunately cannot be here with us today as he is right now speaking in front of the Austrian Parliament. So uh, we're going to show a quick uh, welcome on video. Uh, welcome and thank you for coming. Unfortunately, I cannot be here today as I'm just on my way to the Austrian Parliament in Vienna in order to talk about the digital agenda in front of the European Affairs Committee. While I'm glad to see that digital rights are an issue for the national level, I'm convinced that it especially needs to be tackled at the European level. The question of how to organize copyright in the digital age will be one of the cornerstones of how we access, use and create content in the future. Therefore, I'm glad that Julia and me can co-host this event today and with this event, the European Parliament is set on the forefront of the discussions. Currently, the full potential of the web, especially the EU, context is not used. The possibilities for innovation, sharing and recreation of content are hindered by outdated copyright rules with too many barriers. A copyright reform could bring creative innovation and increased competition. To make sure it does, we have to strengthen the voice of civil society and be aware that the political process is monitored closely by lobbyists from the industry. I'm convinced this event is one further step in the right direction. Enjoy. Uh, welcome and thank you for coming. Unfortunately. Okay, I think uh, one uh, iteration is enough. I am also welcoming you as the co-host. Uh, I'm Julia Reda, newly elected MEP from the German Pirate Party. And uh, being a new MEP, I've uh, actually spent quite a lot of uh, the last decade in research institutions in Europe as a student of uh, political and media studies. And uh, during this time, I've uh, witnessed some progress when it comes uh, to accessing um, cultural heritage and research online. But uh, at the same time, very often you also feel like uh, the potential is there and there is so much possibility to be able to work uh, with uh, digital works online. But sometimes you can't uh, really go all the way. You may not be able to access all of a work. You may not be able to copy uh, parts of a work or you may not be able to search uh, cultural works automatically. So quite often there is still also a bit of a feeling of frustration when uh, dealing with cultural works online and I'm hoping uh, that we can tackle this problem in the European Union. Um, Today's discussion is set on the 96th anniversary of the end of the First World War, and uh, my hope is uh, that we can bridge the gap between Europe's history, on the one hand, that has been documented over centuries already, and the new challenges for cultural and research institutions that are tasks with bringing this cultural heritage into the digital age. What is needed by Europe's libraries and by the archives and universities from politicians, but also from the business side, uh, in order to make it possible that our history in Europe is not forgotten and is preserved for future generations and accessible on the Internet. Um, how can we as policymakers ensure that the cultural heritage institutions can in the online world as in the offline world fulfill their public service on the internet but at the same time also support the creators in Europe and foster innovation in the creative industry. Uh, to discuss this issue with me today are representatives of the European Commission of Cultural Heritage Institutions, the publishing industry and civil society. But before we really start this panel discussion and delve into the quite complex legal and political challenges, I would like to start today's conference with a practical example of uh, a cultural institution in Belgium that is today bridging the gap between our rich cultural heritage and the opportunities of the digital age. 
Uh, about a hundred years ago, the Belgian librarian Paul Otlet dreamed of a universal network that allows the dissemination of knowledge without restrictions. You might say today we are quite close to this dream. Uh, his project, called the Mundaneum, has been described as the first search engine of the world w long time before the Internet was around, and his archiving system has been compared to the hypertext, the system of links that underlies the World Wide Web today. So seeing how close he came 100 years ago in achieving this dream with quite limited technological means, I hope will encourage us in the European institutions to overcome the legal and political challenges that, and truly bring our cultural heritage into the digital age today. So I would now like to give a warm welcome to Delphine Genard, the Deputy Director of Mundaneum, and Jacques Gillen, responsible for Mundaneum's archives, to introduce us to their work and give us a concrete example of what it means today to bring cultural works into the digital environment. Welcome. Merci à Madame Reda pour euh, l'invitation. Nous sommes vraiment euh, honorés de pouvoir introduire cette, euh, cette session euh, en venant présenter le Mundaneum, euh, l'endroit où, quelque part, la technologie, euh, les technologies de l'information euh, ont rendez-vous avec leur archéologie. Alors, le Mundaneum est un centre d'archives qui dépend de la Fédération euh, Wallonie-Bruxelles de Belgique, mais c'est également un musée euh, au cœur de la ville, au cœur de la ville de Mons, plus particulièrement, qui sera capitale européenne de la culture en 2015, l'an prochain, et le Mundaneum compte parmi les partenaires euh, de poids qui ont euh, pesé en faveur de cette candidature. Alors, pour comprendre le Mundaneum, il faut faire un petit retour en arrière dans l'histoire, à Bruxelles, hein, où nous situons, mais en 1895, où deux hommes, deux juristes passionnés de livres euh, et de bibliographies vont se rencontrer euh, autour d'un même projet, d'un même leitmotiv. Donc, il s'agit de Paul Hotelet euh, et de Henri Lafontaine, qui est également prix Nobel de la paix en 1913. Alors, le, leur leitmotiv, c'est vraiment de pouvoir trouver une, une méthode euh, qui leur permettra de collecter, d'indexer et de partager la connaissance humaine à l'échelle globale. Et leur projet est éminemment pacifiste et humaniste. Euh, alors, dans un sens, aujourd'hui, on peut les voir euh, comme des scientifiques des données de leur époque. Et quand on lit ces quelques lignes euh, d'Hotelet, euh, on voit à quel point il évoque déjà la révolution de l'information euh, telle qu'il l'entrevoit. Donc, l'humanité a un tournant de son histoire. En, la masse de données acquises est formidable. Il faut de nouveaux instruments pour les simplifier, les condenser, où jamais l'intelligence ne saura ni surmonter les difficultés qui l'accablent, ni réaliser les progrès qu'elle entrevoit et auxquelles elle aspire. Et ces lignes sont de clé en 34. Alors, pour accomplir cet objectif, les deux hommes vont mettre en place tout un dispositif. Alors, tout d'abord, mettre en place un nouveau système d'indexation des données euh, qu'ils vont appeler la classification décimale universelle. Ça s'est créé en 1895 par leurs soins, une sorte de système numérique d'indexation de l'information. Et ils vont aussi établir un standard pour la fiche, euh, la fiche euh, qu'on retrouvera euh, un peu partout dans le monde. Ceci, évidemment, visant à une plus grande standardisation, un plus grand partage d'une méthodologie commune pour une meilleure compréhension. Alors, ce qu'ils vont faire aussi, c'est qu'ils vont créer un outil d'un genre nouveau qu'ils appellent le répertoire, universel, euh, le répertoire bibliographique universel, qui est aujourd'hui reconnu comme patrimoine documentaire de l'humanité de, de l'UNESCO euh, et qui est considéré véritablement comme le premier moteur de recherche euh, de l'histoire. Celui-ci a été jusqu'à compter euh, 18 millions de fiches, donc 18 millions d'entrées. Alors, à travers toute cette approche, c'est aussi une nouvelle science dont Paul Hotelet sera l'auteur, la science de la documentation qui est interdisciplinaire dans son, dans son, dans son approche. Euh, cette science tend à reconnaître à tout support d'information euh, euh, le, le statut de document, donc quel qu'il soit, qu'il soit livresque, qu'il soit journal, qu'il soit image, euh, et c'est une science qu'il va euh, formaliser dans son, dans son euh, ouvrage le traité de documentation qui a 80 ans cette année. Alors, euh, c'est aussi euh, cette aventure, c'est un projet pour la connaissance universelle qui réunit des volontaires, des hommes et des femmes qui travaillent véritablement dans un esprit euh, nouveau, convaincu d'œuvrer euh, au progrès euh, de l'humanité. Ce projet mobilise également et forcément un réseau mondial un réseau mondial de la coopération intellectuelle de personnes, euh, d'institutions telles que la Library of Congress à Washington ou encore l'Université de Rio. 
euh, et Hôtelier et La Fontaine, évidemment, n'auraient accompli ce projet euh, sans mettre en place un réseau mondial autour du projet. Et d'ailleurs, c'est ce que euh, le magazine, euh, le journal de Spiegel, appelait finalement la connaissance en réseau des décennies avant Google. Alors, ces hommes derrière le réseau de la connaissance, euh, eh bien, font forcément écho avec la notion euh, que met en avant l'inventeur du web, ou un des inventeurs, si on imagine que le web est une invention collaborative, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, qui parle davantage de la, réa de, de la réalité sociale derrière cette invention, plus que de la réalité technique. Alors, le projet d'Hôtel et La Fontaine nécessitait également de faire rupture complète avec un écosystème, avec une vision de leur époque. Et c'est comme ça que Hôtel va formaliser, vraiment, va formuler cette vision nouvelle euh, de l'accès à l'information telle que nous la connaissons aujourd'hui. Euh, cette vision, c'est celle de l'Internet. Mais également, cette vision va prendre corps à travers de différents dessins euh, les dessins euh, dont Hotley est l'auteur et où il anticipe clairement les moyens de communication que nous utilisons quotidiennement, tels la vidéoconférence ou la conférence téléphonique, etc. Alors, on peut dire d'Hotley et La Fontaine, finalement, qu'il se situe euh, à un moment clé de l'histoire des sciences de l'information. Euh, on peut le voir ici sur ce schéma qui est issu d'un atlas de la science publié à MIT Press par une professeure de l'université d'Indianapolis, Katie Burner, euh, où on voit vraiment ce basculement de, de schéma et de mentalité entre euh, l'ère pré-numérique, donc l'ère analogique, et l'ère numérique. Et donc vraiment dans cette manière d'appréhender l'organisation de l'information, Hôtel et La Fontaine se situe vraiment au changement de mindset. Alors, aujourd'hui, cette position des fondateurs du Mundaneum, et à travers eux, la Belgique, euh, est clairement reconnue, euh, que ce soit par la communauté euh, académique, universitaire, vous pouvez en voir quelques-uns ici euh, sur la carte des universités euh, qui ont tout traité euh, et travaillé, étudié l'héritage de Tlay euh, et La Fontaine, mais aussi par des personnalités, mais aussi mais aussi euh, par des personnalités comme le sociologue catalan, vous pouvez voir ici le professeur Manuel Castells, professeur à l'université de Berkeley et théoricien de la société en réseau, qui félicite finalement le Mundaneum pour avoir restauré l'histoire en clé d'avenir. Euh, dans le monde des médias de l'édition, avec cette récente publication de l'auteur Alex Wright, qui était journaliste au New York Times euh, et qui est euh, spécialiste en user experience, euh, en design digital, et donc qui place véritablement Hotley à une période clé de la naissance de l'ère de l'information. Alors, euh, la révolution numérique a véritablement fait entrer le Mundaneum dans le XXe siècle, et le patrimoine matériel et intellectuel d'Hotley euh, et La Fontaine font écho aujourd'hui à des notions telles euh, d'open data, de plateformes collaboratives, d'accès libre euh, et globalisé à la connaissance pour tous. Le Mundaneum, l'année prochaine, en 2015, on l'a dit, euh, dans Mons, capitale européenne de la culture, aura 120 ans euh, et jamais n'aura été aussi pertinent. Alors depuis plusieurs années maintenant, le Millennium a entamé un processus de numérisation de ses collections. Cette numérisation s'est d'abord faite euh, au, petit à petit au fil des moyens dont nous disposons et depuis quelques temps, euh, elle s'est accélérée grâce à l'acquisition euh, de matériel photographique et du scanner que vous pouvez voir sur euh, la photo à l'écran, qui est un scanner à deux professionnels accompagné de programmes de logiciels de numérisation de reconnaissance optique des caractères et d'intégration des métadonnées, autant d'outils qui nous permettent de maîtriser de A à Z le processus de numérisation euh, des documents. Ces numérisations ont deux objectifs. Euh, le premier est la conservation euh, à long terme. Euh, on ne le voit pas très bien, mais il s'agit là d'un journal du 11 novembre 1918, anniversaire oblige, et on voit que euh, ce document est dans un état euh, assez euh, pitoyable de par euh, sa nature, donc le papier euh, acide, etc., de par euh, son âge aussi et de par les manipulations dont il a déjà fait l'objet. La numérisation permet dans ce cas euh, de préserver ces documents de manière euh, pérenne, de garantir euh, leur accès au public et de permettre leur consultation euh, sur le long terme. 
La disponibilité de documents numérisés permet en outre de répondre à plus de demandes, que ce soit pour des publications, pour euh, des expositions. Le fait de pouvoir euh, disposer de fichiers euh, numérisés pour des expositions permet leur intégration dans des animations euh, interactives. On peut aussi répondre plus facilement à des demandes émanant de chercheurs euh, à l'étranger qui n'ont pas toujours la possibilité de se rendre sur place pour consulter des archives ou des bibliothèques. Les, archives permettent, euh, les, les fichiers numérisés pardon, permettent aussi leur euh, valorisation, alors de manière classique, euh, plus facilement dans des livres ou des euh, expositions, ou euh, de manière plus euh, innovante euh, à travers le web. Alors plusieurs, euh, nous exploitons ces archives de plusieurs manières euh, sur le web. Tout d'abord via notre, euh, notre site, euh, grâce auquel nous pouvons euh, présenter une sélection de documents qui ont été numérisés. Grâce aussi euh, à la plateforme de la Fédération Wallonie-Bruxelles qui s'appelle numérique.be et qui euh, permet de présenter des, des collections issues des centres d'archives euh, belges. Nous prévoyons aussi de euh, mettre une série de documents sur euh, Europeana euh, dans un futur proche. Nous organisons des expositions euh, virtuelles. Ici, vous avez l'exemple d'expositions de, que nous avons mises sur la plateforme de Google, le Google Cultural Institute, et qui traite à chaque fois d'un sujet permettant de présenter une sélection de documents. Ici, il y a l'exemple d'une exposition que nous avons faite sur la presse pendant la Première Guerre mondiale. Ces archives numérisées sont aussi exploitées dans des domaines plus spécifiques, euh, par exemple, nous avons participé à un projet interreg euh, lié à la commémoration de la Première Guerre mondiale, projet qui s'appelle « Corps et armes de paix » et pour lequel des archives de Paul Hotelet, d'Henri Lafontaine, euh, relatives à la Première Guerre mondiale, ont été euh, numérisées. Ces archives sont également utilisées dans, euh, dans le domaine des « Digital euh, Humanities euh, ». Nous participons par exemple au projet TIC euh, Belgium, dont le but est de constituer une plateforme de recherche virtuelle sur le thème des organisations internationales et des sciences sociales à la belle époque et pour lequel est mis en place un outil qui permet notamment de visualiser les données que nous introduisons dans un système particulier. Enfin, nous valorisons ces archives numérisées sur les, sur les réseaux sociaux, notamment sur Facebook, Twitter, Google+, YouTube, qui permettent de présenter soit un document, soit un ensemble de documents qu'on met souvent en lien avec l'actualité ou avec des événements en particulier. La question des droits d'auteur n'est pas nouvelle. Nous avons retrouvé dans nos collections cette revue photographique qui date de 1863 et où on se pose déjà la question de la manière dont on peut reproduire des photographies dans la presse, notamment. Euh, ici, il s'agit d'un document issu des papiers personnels d'Henri Lafontaine où euh, il est question aussi de l'utilisation de photographies dans la presse. Henri Lafontaine était un avocat et s'est occupé de, de cette affaire. Euh, D'innombrables documents ne peuvent être mis en ligne à cause de la question des droits d'auteur ou de droits à l'image. Nous avons la chance dans notre cas d'avoir euh, deux fonds pour lesquels ce problème ne se pose pas puisque les papiers d'Henri Lafontaine sont libres de droits depuis maintenant deux ans et nous avons l'autorisation des ayants droit pour euh, l'utilisation des papiers de, de Paul Hotelet. Mais dans bien d'autres cas, euh, la question se pose et par exemple une collection importante de journaux, euh, numérisés, euh, pas de journaux numérisés par la Bibliothèque royale de Belgique n'est pas accessible euh, sur le web. À cause de ces questions de droit, on ne peut les consulter que euh, sur place. Donc, pour nous aussi, cette question est euh, importante. Merci. Thank you very much. I think uh, we all are um, having a more uh, lively image of what it means to uh, be digitizing work in practice. And, uh, Mr. Gillen, if I uh, may ask. Uh, What, in your experience, um, are the most, uh, the biggest difficulties or obstacles in digitizing your content? And uh, also, I would like to know uh, whether the documents that you do put online with Mundaneum, whether they can all be freely re reused by the people accessing your archives. 
Alors, les, au niveau de la difficulté, il euh, bah, y a des difficultés euh, pratiques parce qu'il faut, euh, ça prend du temps de numériser, euh, ça demande des moyens, euh, etc. Donc, ce sont les difficultés euh, essentielles. Après, bah, si on prend l'exemple d'Europeana, il y a la difficulté en termes de, de normes internationales de, de description. Donc, il faut que chaque document euh, corresponde à certaines normes de description pour pouvoir être euh, mis sur euh, Europeana. Uh, J'ai oublié la deuxième partie, excusez-moi. <laughs> What was the second part of the question? Uh, the second part was, since you mentioned that some of your works can only be consulted uh, at uh, the location, mm -hmm. um, the works that you do put online, can they be reused by people who access your archives? For, uh, can they be copied and uh, used in other contexts? No, we um, ask for an authorization for the uh, la, la reproduction of the documents. Euh, donc souvent les documents qui sont en ligne sont des documents en basse définition euh, qui ne peuvent être produits facilement sur, euh, pour des publications. Ok, thank you very much uh, for the presentation. Um, I would like uh, to now move on to the panel discussion and uh, I think uh, this has given us Uh, some of the pointers uh, for the debate and um, even though as you can see from this example uh, there have already been centuries of work going into the archiving of cultural heritage uh, perhaps now is really the best time to discuss this issue of, of digitization and copyright as uh, Commission President Juncker has uh, put copyright reform really front and center in his agenda for the next five years He has uh, tasked the new commission with breaking down national copyright silos. Uh, the importance of the topic was also echoed by the over 10,000 responses to the recent copyright consultation done by Gigi Markt. And um, many individuals have replied to this consultation, but there have been also quite notable contributions from cultural heritage institutions themselves, so they are really also taking a more and more active part in this debate in Europe. Uh, Vice President Ansip wants to not only digitize cultural works, but really make the entire European Commission digital. And uh, the, the outgoing digital agenda, Commissioner Cruz, also made quite a passionate speech about the urgent need for a legislative copyright reform. So um, since we have heard now also from uh, the new Uh, Digital Commissioner Oettinger that there might be a draft for a copyright directive or even a regulation in the next six months. It's really uh, quite uh, the right time to enter into this debate with all the different stakeholders that are part of this uh, discussion already. Uh, the Commission has also just started the ratification process of the WIPO Treaty for the Visually Impaired, which is also um, trying to tackle some of the issues with accessibility of uh, cultural content. And uh, the Orphan Works Directive has just come into force two weeks ago. So there are a lot of uh, things happening on the European level when it comes to cultural heritage and uh, copyright right now. And uh, this conference is supposed to be a start of a series of discussions on the different stakeholder groups' perspectives and uh, what has changed through the digitization uh, of content and also the cross-border dimension of uh, European copyright discussions. So uh, let me introduce, uh, as a panelist from the European Commission, we have Maria Martin Pratt. Uh, who has been in charge of copyright uh, for several years now in the Commission, up until now in uh, Gigi Markt, and has now moved uh, to Digi Connect. Welcome. Um, we also have Mr. Luis Ferrao, uh, who is the principal administrator at Digi Connect and uh, dealing particularly with the issues of digitization. Um, to represent uh, the user's perspective, uh, we have Paul Keller, director at the think tank Kennethland, and a co-founder of Comunia, an organization that is focusing on fostering the digital public domain. Uh, he is advising uh, government and, uh, in um, the Netherlands and also the Commission on Copyright and Open Data and has also been active in the network of EU cultural heritage institution Europeana. Uh, to share the perspective of the creative industry, we have Anne Bergmann, the director of the Federation of European Publishers, and uh, to represent uh, the libraries, who are also an important uh, uh, cultural heritage institution in this debate. Uh, we have Harald Müller, who has uh, gladly accepted uh, to step in for Mr. Stuart Hamilton, who cannot be here with us tonight. 
uh, uh, today, it's not that uh, late yet, but here you never see the sunlight anyway. Uh, so Mr. Müller is a member of the experts group on information law at uh, IBLIDA, which is uh, the document delivery and resource sharing section of IFLA, the Federation of Libraries Associations Worldwide. And he's deputy speaker of the coalition Copyright for Education and Research. Um, I would like to uh, give the floor to the panelists for a short uh, presentation on their views on the European copyright reform and the challenges ahead for bringing cultural heritage into the digital age. And uh, I would like uh, to uh, encourage you to actively participate in the discussion after that. So we'll try uh, to, to keep the introductory remarks relatively brief so we will have uh, some time also for discussion with the audience. And I welcome uh, Anne Bergmann to uh, start with the first intervention. Thank you, good morning. Uh, just uh, uh, first a comment in seeing the uh, poster of uh, this meeting, I was wondering who is Goliath and who is David. I know it's not David and Goliath, but I'm, I'm wondering uh, in the information society if uh, the publishers are always the Goliath of, uh, of uh, this issue. Anyhow, uh, just a few words about publishing. Uh, publishing is, I, I'm not going to bore you with figures. Uh, you can find them on our website, and we've been repeating them over and over. But uh, being a publisher is not just uh, having a job. It's, it's having a passion. A publisher is someone who uh, accompany the authors, whether they are literary authors, and that's the most visible part of the uh, trade, but also uh, if they are educational authors or, or if they do uh, all type of writing, children's book and thinking, and uh, books are making people uh, grow, grow intellectually, grow uh, uh, in a cohesive society. And furthermore, it's a very uh, dynamic sector. And when we speak about copyright, we ha I think that we have to think about the choice of the author. An author can decide either to um, work with a publisher and uh, sign a contract and hope that his or her work will reach the largest audience possible, or they may decide to auto-publish it used to be called vanity publishing in the past, but uh, I think that it has changed dramatically with the uh, Internet, and now uh, there's a lot of works being published, uh, self-published, under uh, Creative Commons, or uh, actually most of the self-published works are uh, against payment. But uh, if we go back to the choice of the author, either the author wants to directly share uh, in the sense of freely share his content, or he wants to share but also get some form of remuneration. And I think that needs to be respected, whatever uh, reform of copyright uh, there is. Concerning digitization and uh, the uh, cultural institution, I just want to say that uh, as far as book publishers are concerned, uh, we are responsible for a good deal of the uh, culture, uh, the collections of the cultural institution because we publish uh, about half a million new books every year. So that's a, a lot of books that go into the shelves of libraries. We, uh, when we were, we started to be alerted on the issue, uh, and it became a really important issue when uh, Google started to digitize the work, and when the European Commission, supported by the uh, member states, decided to launch uh, what was the ancestor of Europeana and became Europeana. And uh, since the very beginning, together with the librarians, the authors, and the collecting society, we thought we needed a solution to identify the status of a work. And this is why, thanks to the help of the Commission, we were able to put together Arrow, which is a system that allows you uh, to determine uh, whether a work is in the public domain. And there, I would say, uh, as publishers, we really happy when a work comes into the public domain because if it has still success 70 years after uh, the death of the author, uh, that's very few works actually, then uh, we, we're very happy that we can all republish that work. 
uh, with arrows, so we have a system, and in the words of the British Library, that's a system that goes from the identification of a work that was taking four hours to three minutes. So I think it's really worth for cultural institutions to use systems such as Arrow. Uh, as far as either uh, often works, you mentioned the uh, directive and uh, the publisher supported the directive and uh, we hope it's going to be adopted uh, in the countries where it's still uh, prepared legislation. But also in, uh, as far as uh, out of commerce works, we worked again with the libraries, uh, the authors and the collecting society to sign a memorandum on out of commerce works and there's a couple of countries who have actually put this memorandum into uh, motion. Uh, differently because all uh, the, the countries have different uh, rhythm in digitizing their collection. It's not just an issue of copyright, it's an issue of finance, it's an issue, as you said, of the technical difficulties in digitizing. Uh, but in Germany, all of the books pre-1965 can who are no longer in commerce and for which the Auto 7 uh, objectives can be digitized, and in France, it's all of the books uh, until uh, the uh, beginning of the 21st century, which are out of commerce, and that can be digitized, and there's an agreement which has been put into a law. There are some other countries, like Poland or the Czech Republic, uh, who have similar system. Unfortunately, there's some countries also who have digitized uh, books and haven't even started to discuss with authors and publishers, and therefore the books have, can only be consulted within the premises of a library, which is a real shame, especially as those books, we, we, we don't intend to sell them because they're no longer uh, in commerce. As far as the in-commerce books are concerned, we have solution. Uh, we are developing um, as quickly as the uh, e-book market is developing, that is rather modestly, uh, in Germany, it's below 6%. In France, it's 4% of the market is digital e-books. So, oh, well, that's uh, pleonasm. Uh, e-books, and therefore, uh, there are offers, but uh, they're growing as, as fast as the market is growing. We want to address the issue of uh, e-lending with the librarians. We've been discussing that. We have, uh, it depends, of course, what type of books you're talking about, uh, books that are meant for the uh, pedagogical uses. Those are accessed often in intranet. But we also have solutions for uh, visually impaired people, and I'm thinking of the uh, wonderful project in Italy called LIA, which allows uh, visually impaired people to have access to books, but not just to have e-books that they can read, but they can go into a virtual library which they can serve uh, because it's adapted for them. They can pay with means which, is, which are adapted for visually impaired. Uh, I just also wanted to say that whenever you digitize things of interoperability, digitize in format that can be read on any, on all devices, don't limit to yourself to proprietary devices. We are pushing for interoperability. We're pushing also for, uh, the identification of works. Uh, you, you mentioned this, uh, standardization publishers, uh, were, uh, uh the first, I think, in the cultural sector to have a identification with the ISBN and uh, we follow that up with a number of uh, in the identification uh, including the digital object and the identifier which is a persistent identifier and I just want to conclude in saying uh, in asking what is copyright for and I trust that for publishers copyright is there to encourage creation and the investment in creation and if you want to do that you have to keep this incentive that will make people uh, keep on writing and people keep on, on wanting to publish them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I now give the floor to Mr. Harald Müller of the IFLA. Thank you very much. Good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, I came here on a very short notice, so I have to read some of the notes uh, given by Stuart Hamilton to me. Uh, I beg your pardon for that. First of all, I want to introduce uh, IFLA. IFLA is the world's biggest organization representing the interests of library and their users. 
because uh, libraries are service institutions for users and don't have uh, uh, the, their own purpose just for themselves. Please don't forget that. Uh, IFLA has uh, 1,500 members worldwide in 150 countries, and uh, we have uh, 700 uh, members in Europe, including the biggest national libraries and national library associations. The overall message we wish to convey is that an international instrument on copyright exceptions and limitations for libraries will improve things for European library users by allowing cross-border sharing of information. And that's at the moment is the main point of our arguments, cross-sharing of information. Uh, I'll give you an example in a minute. And updating laws around the world for the digital age. We want the European Union to engage constructively at WIPO, this is the World Intellectual Property Organization in Geneva, because it is in the best interests of European cultural institutions, their users, and the preservation of European cultural heritage. We also want the European Union to continue with copyright reform for digital media, media especially. And uh, the European Union has uh, some, in the last uh, years, some very good starting points for that. Two of them have been mentioned already by Anne Bergman. Uh, one is uh, the Often Works Directive. Uh, uh, and the other is the Memorandum of Understanding uh, regarding out-of-commerce works. These have been implemented in some uh, European member states, and these are good examples uh, for what uh, the European Union pushed on. So let me now uh, give you a very funny example, because uh, uh, as you saw at the... the um, entrance preservation libraries standing for a long time as service points for users and now we have the digital area. You know that in Europe the European Union puts a lot of effort in what's called Euro regions. These are regional areas at national borders working together with other uh, regional areas uh, around, uh, uh, over the, the national border. One example is the area, southern part of Germany, where Germany meets France and Switzerland. These are the cities, Strasbourg, Freiburg, Bail, Basel in Switzerland. And if you have a library card of Strasbourg, you can also use the library in Bail or in Freiburg. And of course, you uh, can get books from all these other libraries by interlibrary loan. The book comes to the reader. And it's not like in the Middle Ages that you have to saddle your horse and ride uh, to the other city to get the book and read the book. No. Now, the funny thing is, if it's an e-book, we are back in the Middle Ages because an e-book license for the library in Strasbourg can, is not accessible in Freiburg or in Bale. So you have, again, saddle your horse, which is, uh, uh, I think, mm, this is for comedy, but it's the truth, because e-books are only accessible via license contracts and nothing is regulated in copyright law. So the user has to go where the e-book is licensed and, uh, well, yeah, it brings us back into the Middle Ages. On the other side, we have the media change. Everybody is using media, media equipment, electronic equipment. Uh, a lot of you have your, your smartphones. Uh, I don't know what you're doing with that, reading your emails. So every, the information comes to you, but in the uh, area of uh, European uh, national borders, it's an absolute border, and there's no access uh, uh, over the border for, e uh, for digital media. So, 
IFLA is uh, arguing on that and trying uh, to lobby for that. And uh, since 2008, IFLA has been working at WIPO's standing committee in uh, Geneva on, international, on an international solution for the problem of outdated copyright exceptions for libraries. We wish to see a global framework that will extend exceptions in countries that lack them in the world, developing world and benefit all WIPO member states, including those of the European Union, by facilitating the transfer of information between libraries across borders, thus bringing the international copyright framework into the digital age and supporting science, culture, research. So, IFLA wants at WIPO uh, to establish basic international standards of copyright exceptions and limitations, ensure equal treatment of digital resources, protect the ability to acquire and lend. Well, lend, uh, in fact, it's not lending, it's copying digital collections, unlock orphan works, safeguard other cultural and scientific heritage. Also, IFLA is supporting the Marrakesh Treaty for the uh, visually impaired people. Libraries are essential to fil fulfill the promise of the treaty. We make accessible format available, and we are trusted partners for publishers. Uh, we are working together uh, with publishers uh, to make printed books available for people with a print uh, seeing disability. IFLA's Library Serving Persons with Printed Disabilities section is taking an active role in getting library services ready for treaty implementation. We want the European Union uh, to uh, support our efforts, and uh, uh, we don't know what at the moment is the uh, situation inside the European Union, but we uh, would be very happy if uh, the European Union would sign this treaty. Well, that's it for the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, we now hand over to the Commission, and I'm sure they can give us some insights on the current development. We will start uh, with Maria Martin Pratt. Thank you very much, and good morning to everybody. We are going to do a little bit of a double act with the blessing of Madame Reda. Uh, we thought to, uh, with Louise uh, that I will talk to the issues related to copyright, but he could uh, talk to the issues related to the efforts of mass digitization and Europeana. Uh, but I'll try to go faster so we don't need too much of, of the time uh, that you have located to us. Uh, <clears throat> and basically... Let me give you a few pointers on what I think is an important debate. I have to say beforehand that, indeed, when uh, in your presentation for the panel you've said uh, the EP discussions are at the forefront, uh, you're absolutely right. You are at the forefront in the sense that this new commission, uh, as you know, has been in office for a week and a half. So we have, as you have, a very clear commitment from uh, President Juncker uh, to modernize copyright, as he has put it, in the light of the digital revolution, new consumers' behavior, and Europe's cultural diversity. Uh, but you will understand as well if I said to you that we are at the moment starting to discuss this uh, with the different commissioners that will be following this issue, uh, Mr. Ortinger in the first place, Mr. Ansip. Uh, and therefore, I can describe you where we are, what we have done. I cannot tell you where we are going yet. Uh, but uh, just to, to, to start with the pointers, because I think this is important for the discussion. Um, and again, this is exclusively talking about the copyright angle, but I think it's important, as it's been highlighted by some of the interveners before me, uh, digitization, uh, cultural heritage is not an issue just uh, about copyright. It's very much as well about having the right identifiers, having the money to digitize, having the right infrastructure. But going back to copyright, when we look at this issue, basically normally we look at it from two points of view. One is uh, which are the exceptions in copyright legislation that can help 
uh, the digitization of content by libraries, by museums, by archives. So limitations and exceptions, obviously one big part of it. But the other equally big part of it as well is what can be done to facilitate clearance of, clearance of rights. Uh, it is very often uh, pointed out by libraries that uh, there is a high cost in trying to identify and to clear the licenses when they need to do so with the content. And the content that we're talking about is, is a very, very varied content. We're talking about content that is in the public domain. Okay, that we wouldn't bother from copyright, although the problem is that sometimes it's not easy to know if it is in the public domain. We're talking about content that can be often, often works. We are talking about content that may be out of commerce, or you may think is out of commerce. Uh, and then we're talking about content that is in commerce. I mean, libraries do have content that goes from the very old to the very new. So all that variety needs to be taken into account. Uh, it was very interesting in the Mundanio uh, presentation to see that Photographs were already given a headache a century ago because it is in this. Uh, it's not the same type of problems you face when you're looking into uh, books, that when you're looking into images, when, when you're looking into audiovisual works, documentaries, and so forth and so on. So this needs to be taken into account. And reality is catching up with us. Uh, we are talking about the preservation not any longer just of the beautiful objects in paper, uh, that it is degrading, but libraries are increasingly also preoccupied about uh, the preservation of born digital content, including web, uh, and web harvesting is also part of, of the discussions. Now, I'm not going to get into uh, a long uh, explanation as to what we have done so far, uh, but just a very quick uh, recalling of things that we already have in place. And I know that there is always a tendency to say, well, let's go for the copyright reform only. Anything that has been done before is of no use. I'm sure Paul will say something like that after me. Uh, I don't think that's correct. And it's not only because this was part of the effort of the last commission. It's because very often in life, it's not just the discussion you have to have a political level and the laws you have to adopt is making sure after that that's going to work in practice. And that often takes a lot of effort. It's not politically flashy, but without that last leg of effort, nothing happens on the ground. Now, what well, we have for the time being, the Orphan Works Directive that, as you indicated, has entered into force a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and obviously, we are working to ensure that all member states implement it and implement it properly. With the Orphan Works Directive, we had something which I think is interesting and interesting to think about it in the future going forward. We have the Orphan Works databases gone online two weeks ago. Uh, it is hosted in OHIM, the Office uh, for Harmonization in the Internal Market, the trademark office in Alicante. Uh, and we already have a list of, for the time being, books orphan books that have been uploaded there. The idea is to have a registry of books that have been declared orphans, so institutions that can benefit and use those orphan works have access and know what is already out there and don't have to incur into extra costs doing, again, things that all the beneficiaries have done. Uh, so that is one part of the element. We are also looking into the implementation of uh, the Memorandum of Understanding of Out of Commerce. This is related to how can we use licensing and methods such as extended collective licensing to facilitate, to bring down the cost of clearance of rights. And there's been reference made to efforts in France and Germany. Uh, they are ongoing as well in Poland, in Slovakia, uh, in the UK. And we are trying as well to push on, on that front. Um, and we would like as well to start discussing uh, in the particular area of film and film heritage, which is a headache. The Out of Commerce uh, Memorandum of Understanding relates to books and learned journals. Uh, we need to see what we can push to help film heritage institutions uh, having less of a threshold of clearance of rights when they cannot profit from an exceptional limitation. Very quickly as well, uh, the Marrakesh Treaty, uh, it has been signed by uh, the European Union already. What we are aiming at now is the ratification, and indeed what we have now adopted as the Commission is the proposal for the Council, after receiving as well the, the endorsement of the Parliament, which I'm sure the Parliament will give, uh, to authorize the Commission to ratify the treaty on behalf of the EU and its member states. Now, 
In terms of work going forward, we have been doing quite an important amount of work in also checking what is the state of our limitations and exceptions. Basically, in the community a key, you do have, uh, notably in the 2001 Copyright Directive, Infrastructure Directive, but also in the Rental Lending Directive, you have the, uh, the exceptions and limitations which are for the benefit of those we are speaking about today. So the libraries, the archives, the museums. Uh, and normally, you know, just going very fast, we're talking about the preservation exception, uh, the exception that allows for provision of access and uh, the public lending. Now, when we have been looking into these exceptions and the current legal framework, uh, we've been doing that through uh, legal studies. Uh, we have a number of studies that you can see in our uh, websites to, to assess the functioning and the implementation of uh, these rules in member states, uh, economic studies as well that you can find in our uh, website, and obviously as you refer to the public consultation that we undertook uh, in the first half of this year and that had a very large response including by heritage institutions. Uh, not only those representing uh, heritage institutions like IBLIDA, like IFLA, uh, like uh, other organizations like Paul's ones, but also uh, by individual libraries, uh, university libraries, research libraries, and also public libraries. Now, there are things which uh, I think are clear in the debate today, which is that we need to see uh, for the update of such limitations and exceptions. Uh, there are things which I don't think I'm discovering anything new, which we are examining. One is Many of these exceptions, most of these exceptions, are not of a mandatory nature. So that leads to very different way of implementing at national level when they are implemented. Uh, some of them, I think, is fair, and this is part of uh, the public consultation. We had at the time to say we need a discussion as to whether they are uh, in sync with the realities of a digital single market. And we are talking about, for instance, some exceptions that will say consultation on the premises of libraries. Well, what can we do in the 21st century to get uh, that exception up to the realities of the 21st century while trying to respect a bit as well, of course, the balance uh, that we need to get into the whole system to function, including uh, making sure that the interests of right holders are respected. Uh, the same thing is as regards uh, e-lending. Uh, e-lending is not covered by an exception at the moment. Do we need an e-lending exception? Is this something that we could consider as an equivalent to physical lending, or are we talking about an activity that will be completely different in effect on the market? Uh, and this is something that is also part of a difficult uh, debate. Um, another thing that is, um, that is important in these discussions, besides uh, the assessment as to the state of, uh, of our legislation uh, in terms of the exceptions there and their nature, is their cross-border effect. It's probably one of the issues where we are going to be uh, more careful going forward is making sure there is a strong internal market element in our legislation. And that internal market element uh, is not always present uh, as regards limitations and exceptions, for instance, is only with the orphan works that we have foreseen a cross-border effect. It's quite normal. In 2001, when the IFASOC Directive was adopted, I think there was less of a discussion. I know when, when we negotiated the Orphan Works Directive, there was, of course, no question that we will do that without being able to provide for cross-border effect to the use of Orphan Works once the Orphan Works status was established. And I think going forward, that will be part of, of the discussion about the other exceptions and limitations. So that is like a very fast, sorry to speak so fast, portrait as to where we are. And uh, I'm sure that uh, Luis will be happy to, to just touch on, on the rest. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Maria. Uh, good morning, everybody. I will just uh, complement uh, Maria's presentation with uh, a concrete example how this uh, strategy of digitization and uh, uh, online accessibility uh, works at the European level. Uh, but uh, I will have to move to uh, uh, close to the computer to shift uh, the slides. So I, I apologize for turning you the back. Um, so uh, um, just to uh, announce that uh, <clears throat> this is a very topical uh, meeting because indeed uh, one month ago we just issued the first uh, progress report on implementing uh, the Commission 
recommendation on digitization. And this is already available on the web for more than one month, so you can all download it and read at your will. But I will present, because it's a quite dense document, with a couple of slides. So this is the Commission recommendation 2011-711 EU. It was not the first such recommendation. There was already a previous one in 2006, building on the work done under the Digital Libraries Initiative. And there were two progress reports on the implementation of this 2006 recommendation. In 2011, it was recognized that these recommendations needed some updates. So we adopted another recommendation, which already covers Europeana, which had been launched in the meantime. And now this is the first implementing report that has just been published on the two first years of implementing the 2011 recommendation. It's a very dense document, because it gathers replies to a questionnaire of 30 questions distributed among 32 countries. And we got 25 national reports, which give a matrix of 750 entries, covering the five chapters of the recommendation, meaning digitization, public domain, in-copyright works, Europeana, and digital preservation. We could recognize some major trends on the different chapters on digitization. There are a growing number of national or regional or local plans, sometimes only at the level of the culture institutions, according to the different countries. There are additional budgets being, let's say, sometimes imagined out of the blue to cover these activities, like dedicated tax chairs, tax credits, lottery funds, public loans, et cetera. Some countries have already some overviews of the digitized material, but this remains an exception. And there's growing cross-border collaboration also under the European-related projects and aggregators or sector aggregators. Public-private partnerships are starting to gain momentum. Everybody knows about Google's PPPs, but also ProQuest and some telecom companies or foundations. Also crowdfunding is being driven to help in funding this type of activities. And the structural funds are being used more and more also for digitization of cultural heritage. So in a nutshell, there's a more growing pooling of digitization efforts, which is one of the recommendations from the Commission. On online accessibility, we have seen an improve of web visibility of cultural content. There are innovative interactions, including the social media, blogs, crowdsourcing, et cetera, and wider use opportunities with the PSI directive that is now under the transposition deadline, but also APIs, better resolution and metadata, et cetera. Finally, as already mentioned by Maria and others, the Orphan Works Directive, some schemes in member states to backup collective management solutions with legislative provisions and rights clearing platforms and out-of-commerce legislation. For Europeana, I will not dwell too much because I know Paul will refer to this. 
Uh, on digital preservation, it's uh, probably not the topic of this uh, meeting, but uh, I'll just uh, mention briefly uh, there are um, more and more uh, uh, strategies for preserving also uh, digital content, uh, also with the legal deposit uh, solutions covering uh, being extended to, to this type of content. Uh, also provisions for allowing uh, uh, migration of digitized material. Uh, these are still uh, uh, rather scarce and uh, um, not, uh, not at all uh, the, the general uh, situation. Uh, there are some arrangements for uh, digital bore material uh, in a couple of countries, uh, but uh, uh, the uh, solutions for web content uh, harvesting or preservation uh, remains uh, really a uh, uh, work under construction. So uh, as regards the challenges that are identified uh, uh, in this uh, first progress report, uh, the situation is still patchy uh, among the EU uh, member states, uh, widely dependent on the cultural institutions initiative and funding. Uh, there, there are limited overviews of the digitization activities across sectors and borders and uh, uh, there's uh, scarred uh, and unevenly spread use of uh, public-private uh, partnerships or structural funds uh, to uh, uh, fund these uh, type of activities. Uh, as regards online accessibility, this is probably more in, in touch with uh, our topic today. Uh, there are uh, remaining uh, difficulties both with in copyright material and with the public domain material. Uh, for public domain, you have uh, still uh, intrusive watermarking that uh, uh, makes uh, reuse difficult or uh, sometimes even access. Uh, there are um, some cultural heritage protection laws that alongside copyright are uh, a new layer of barrier uh, against reproduci reproduction of cultural heritage in some countries. Uh, there are uh, contractual constraints and cultural institutions policy that sometimes stand on the way of uh, 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 reproduction and the uh, use of public domain material. And then uh, you, you see low quality or res resolution and poor metadata or uh, unclear rights situation, which is a topic that affects in particular uh, photographs. For in copyright, uh, uh, the challenges are uh, proper implementation and timely implementation of the Work and Works Directive uh, and uh, uh, legal backing uh, schemes uh, for uh, wide-scale digitization and cross-border accessibility of out-of-commerce work. Uh, we have uh, for the moment two, at least two examples in Germany and France, uh, but uh, they are of uh, uh, different uh, scope and uh, nature. Uh, uh, as uh, Anne Bergman already mentioned, in Germany it only goes up to uh, 1966. Uh, uh, in France it covers the entire uh, 20th, uh, 20th, uh, 20th century books. But uh, uh, while in France uh, it's uh, also for commercial purpose, uh, uh, in Germany it's only for non-commercial purpose, and there are also some cross-border issues. Um, so uh, I would just want to finish with mentioning the implementation of rights information databases connected at the European level is one of the aspects covered by the recommendation. Uh, there are some work being done there, uh, ARRO, uh, also another project for audiovisual material, uh, which uh, kind of successor ARRO. We have now this uh, um, database in the OHIM on orphan work. So, uh, there are uh, progress uh, done in this area, but uh, uh, we, we still uh, are at a very uh, preliminary stage, uh, I would say. And uh, I will uh, just finish uh, uh, with this slide. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, we come to the last intervention by Paul Keller and then enter into the discussion. Okay. Um, I have a colleague who's going to do the slides for me so I can, can stay up here. Um, can we get that full screen? Okay, um, so I, I, I tried to stay really brief to, um, to actually have some discussion and I think I've been introduced, so I'm from Kennisland, I'm working with Europeana, I'm also chair of the um, Dutch Cultural Heritage Institutions Working Group on Copyright 
And um, can, next slide. Um, so we've been um, working for the past 10 years or something with cultural heritage institutions, transforming that, which was on the last slide, into this. Um, the first is old tape material, which was rotting away. The other thing, if you don't recognize that, that's um, magnetic tapes, which go into a tape robot, and which is kind of like the de facto long-term storage for very, really large files. Um, and what we need to observe here is that we are in the middle of one of the most fundamental changes in how we preserve and access our cultural heritage, probably the most fundamental change since the invention of print. And um, we need, um, and I'm showing here, by the way, I'm showing not books on purpose because we've been talking a lot about books, but I also want to really focus your imagination on the fact that this is not only about books, this is about video material, this is about audio material, this is about photography. And um, what we see in the context of Europeana, that people like the, the users are especially interested in visual material. So um, we find a lot of solutions for books, but um, or we're trying to, to work solutions for books first, but the, the urge of people, what people want to see is their audiovisual heritage. It's not the books. Nobody's interested in books from the 18th century except a couple of researchers, to put it bluntly. Can I have the next slide? Um, and to put something else very bluntly, the current copyright system has not been designed for this transformation, and our cultural heritage institutions who are tasked with managing this transformation deserve much better. Um, next slide, please. They deserve better than an Orphan Works Directive that does not help with mass digitization. The Orphan Works Directive is broken from the start. It is made on the basis that you have to look work by work for rights holders which are not there, which do not want to be found, which have abandoned their works, and it put all the costs of this on the culture heritage institutions. The resources they spent on that can be much better used um, digitizing material, building infrastructures, pushing this material into the schools. This is really what we're, what we're seeing here is, 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 is a transformation from really like a whole situation where cultural heritage institutions ask people to come to them to something where they are part of a network and they really need to push their material out there and it needs to be everything they have needs to be digital for this. And this is like we will look back at this at a situation of transformation and we will wonder why we struggled so long with this. Um, and part of that is copyright. We deserve better than a copyright uh, directive that allows us to digitize works only in certain special cases. We need to be able, or cultural heritage institution needs to be digitize their entire collections for no good reason other than making them digital because digital is the future. Um, and nobody gets harmed from digitizing a book which is in a library. Nobody gets harmed from digitizing a film which is rotten away on the shelves of a cultural heritage institution. This is something that is, um, this is a victimless crime, if this could be a crime, it's not really. Um, next thing, um, the, we, we need better than a copyright directive that allows us to make works available only via dedicated terminals. I don't know who of you has interacted with a dedicated terminal in a library or museum or archive recently. Um, most of the time we're, um, interacting and our kids interact with universal terminals that are connected to the network. That is where people consume content. If we want people to consume the stuff that is preserved in cultural heritage institutions, and this is not the easiest content to get people interested in, then we need to be at least there where their eyes are, where their intention is. We can't like ask them to come into a library and look for a dedicated terminal. Um, and that is the reality of copyright law right now. Um, further, we need better than a lending directive that allows libraries or that puts libraries more or less at the, at the mercy of publishers when they want to transfer to digital formats. We've heard a lot about that. Um, so how do we get there? So Europe needs a copyright system that allows for universal access. Next slide. And how do we get there? How do we realize that? I think, um, and this comes a little bit drawing on the consultation, the responses to the consultation that was mentioned earlier. Um, we need to question ourselves, do we really deal with opposing interests here? And I would argue we don't. Um, if you parse, and uh, Maria's unit has done a great job in summarizing the 11,000 answers or so in a, a concise document of 50 pages, which is still a lot, uh, or 100 pages, um, which is 
still a lot. Um, it comes down, if you look clearly at the answers directly related to cultural heritage institutions, the cultural heritage institutions by and large express the desire to make the material available that nobody else makes available, that the publishers do not make available anymore because they've lost interest. It doesn't make sense for them to make that commercially available to take risks. And that the publishers and authors and their representatives mainly voice concerns not about that it's a bad thing that this material becomes available. What they are concerned about is that this making available would somehow create unfair competition with their business practices. And I don't think that's the, that's the case. Can we have the next slide, please? Um, so I would, I would argue that we need to look at this not as opposing interests but as complementary roles. Cultural heritage institutions are there primarily or one big part of their existence is to ensure that cultural heritage that is not in commercial exploitation anymore remains available for everyone to access. And the creators and publishers, their primary thing, and I, I think unworded that slightly different, but uh, my slides were already done, is to publish new books, to create new works. And unsaid, like the incentive of copyright, she looks at copyright as something that needs to incentivize authors and intermediaries, publishers, um, to take the risk to publish something, to produce new culture. And I think we need to find a dividing line between there where there's a motivation, we need a system that encourages production and that at the same time doesn't artificially um, limit us from um, accessing our future. And I think we are in positions to make that done. Um, next slide and what needs to happen, next slide. Um, so we need to update the exceptions in the InfoSoc directive, like the, the one on, on, on reproductions is fairly obvious. It needs to allow all forms of reproduction of works that are in the, in the collection of an institution for all purposes, but primarily including for making, for digitizing the collection. The more interesting one is, of course, the one which deals with the dedicated terminals and the private study and research. Um, and, and, and I think if we, if we honestly do not want to do something which we need to revise in 10 years again because like our society has gotten more digital and more connected to the internet, then we need to ensure that these institutions can make that material which is not actively managed, which is not in commercial circulation anymore, available online. Put it on their websites not do any business with it, not for commercial purposes, but just make it available to the citizens interested in this. And we need to find a solution for e-lending um, that was discussed by previous speakers, and I think that brings me to the end. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think what we've heard from all the different interventions is that there is uh, some level of frustration with what you have uh, uh, described Mr. Müller as this Middle Ages situation of uh, not being able to access uh, the contents that uh, uh, public heritage, uh, cultural heritage institutions have at their premises to not be able to access that online. Now, uh, Mrs. Martin Pratt has uh, uh, made a quite uh, topical uh, suggestion that we need to talk about an e-lending exception, and uh, uh, Mr. Keller has also uh, said that the, the publishers might be concerned about uh, uh, this leading to perhaps an unfair competition between e-lending and e-books. And uh, um, your organization, Eblida, is uh, at the same time um, advocating for a right to e-read. Uh, so I would like uh, to ask uh, the two of you, Mrs. Backman and, and Mr. Müller, uh, do we need uh, a legislative uh, exception for e-lending? And, uh, well, is there a danger for the publishing industry in this, uh, if we made this a reality? Uh, thank you very much. Of course, um, uh, the oh, sorry. Uh, thank you. Uh, library associations have been um, uh, uh, trying uh, to lobby for e-lending um, put down in the law. We have in copyright law uh, the principle of exhaustion, which uh, only uh, governs and uh, uh, is uh, available for tangible objects. It doesn't work for digital objects. As long as uh, a book, a movie, a game has been sold, it can be uh, put on a second-hand market, it uh, could be given away, and so on. And it also can be lent out by libraries. Uh, this, um, the right of uh, the 
which is part of copyright, of distribution will exhaust if uh, after the first uh, sale of an object. This does not work for digital objects, and it's laid down uh, in uh, the InfoSoc Directive of 2001, uh, which says for digital objects, everything is a service, and it can only be regulated by uh, a, a license. And uh, so uh, libraries have to sign licenses for all their digital objects. And, of course, if you go, for example, to a public library here in Brussels or where I come from in Germany, we have the so-called online, uh, and more and more people using that, but it's uh, based on a license, which means some titles are available and some titles of books, uh, bestsellers, are not available because the publishers have in mind uh, we can sell uh, or we can generate more income if we only sell them to the end user and not uh, give a license to uh, public libraries. And um, uh, also we have uh, restrictions uh, for cross-border availability. For example, in uh, the library I worked for a long time, we found out that an, it, a, a book published in Italy was sold over the Amazon website in Italy, and it was not available for a research library in Germany. That's it. So I think we need uh, a copyright exception or a solution or how we could describe that. I, I'm not hanging on the word exception. This is a, a little bit uh, um, um, putting up some people on this exception. <laughs> well, maybe we find a solution. And uh, I think uh, mankind has so inventive over the million of years, I think we can find a solution if we want to. Thank you. Well, I, I completely agree with the idea of finding solution. Uh, I think that publishers have always relied on library as they are relying on, on booksellers also to give access to content or to their books. I don't like the word content. I should just remove it from my vocabulary. I think we're talking of books in, or, or other types of works. Uh, just one figure is... Uh, nowadays, in the Nordic country, where the network of library is the most developed, uh, the acquisition by libraries is 4% of the global turnover of publishing. 96% of the, glo the, the, the revenues, and therefore, uh, uh, which makes everything work, is, is made by uh, individual acquisition. So we need to find a system that we respect the ecosystem, uh, and, and, and we're open to solution. I'm very surprised with the cross-border effect because, you know, books, when we buy rights, either for our original version or a translation, we have uh, at least pan-European uh, territorial rights. So I, I'm, I'm follow-up with you on those issues, and I, I agree. I mean, I hate horses, so I wouldn't go to a library uh, across the border uh, uh, saddling my horse. Uh, so contractual solution, uh, again, uh, when you have 4% of reading, which is uh, digital reading, uh, you have, uh, I, I wouldn't say you have time to develop solution, but at least it's giving you some, some possibility to work together. And I think that there are, uh, in, uh, in France, by example, there's a solution that respects the ecosystem because you have to buy the e-books via uh, booksellers and local booksellers, not just giant uh, online retailers, uh, but uh, you have your local. So if you are a library in Montpellier, you go to the Montpellier bookshop, you buy your bookshop, you, you buy your e-book there, and then you can access it. And I can tell you we came with a, uh, uh, a publishers from Gallimard to show uh, how it was working, and here from Brussels, with uh, the commission IP address, when we showed it around, it was working. So there was not cross-border limitation. So it's, there may be in some cases, and then we need to work to eliminate them. And then I have just, and it's a very personal comment. I'm not sure that library has to learn, have to be 
at the forefront of lending bestseller. I think that libraries have a different uh, uh, purpose. They have to bring uh, books that may have more difficulties in going into the market than the bestseller. But that's a very personal comment. Um, Mr. Keller, speaking of these uh, uh, cross-border effects, uh, Mrs. Blackman is saying that uh, um, cross-border licenses are available. So uh, why do problems persist in this sector? And, uh, uh, of course, uh, as a, uh, European institutions, I think everybody agrees that we need solutions. What we are always trying to find out is whether these solutions have to be legislative. Uh, so I would uh, like uh, to hear your views on that. So where do, does the licensing approach fall short and where is legislative action needed? Um, well, the, the, the cross-border licenses are available and, and, and cross-border licenses are working in some fields. The, ma the main part where this is short, and I think that was the key of my, my argument, is um, we have created a copyright system that, that, that grants an enormous amount of protection and for a very long period to authors who in the majority of all cases tend to lose interest in their creation and they just disappear. They do not responsibly act with that. And um, if you look at the collections of cultural heritage institutions and really like libraries are maybe the worst example, look at archives which have like photographic records of the 20th century. The majority of that stuff doesn't have identifiable authors where you can go to and obtain a license. That's the problem. The licensing approach falls short when you can't obtain a license and as copyright is structured in a way where if you do not obtain a license or some other form of um, um, uh, uh, permission, then you can't use that thing. Then you are infringing um, the copyright of someone who doesn't care about it, but you're still infringing it. And since we're dealing with public institutions for a big deal here, the appetite for risk-taking and actually willfully go out and infringe people's rights um, is fairly minimal. So what we are... what and, 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 of course, historically, like the... The, the exceptions and limitations are something which comes into place in areas where licensing does not work, where licensing comes at its edges. And I think, and my argument was, we need to contour the, the, the next version of the exceptions benefiting cultural heritage institutions carefully around that areas where licensing works so that they cover as much as possible of the areas where licenses doesn't work. And licensing doesn't work in these areas where the authors are not known or where there is simply no economic interest in obtaining a license, in, in providing a license. Nobody's interested in licensing like individual old photographs to um, cultural heritage institutions because the economic value of these things is minimal. You won't pay anything. That will be licenses for nothing. And um, there are very few um, people, there are, like who engage in providing licenses for for free in order to, to allow the access to this material. It's simply ineffective licensing in these areas. And we need to focus licensing on the areas where it's effective and exceptions and limitations on the areas where licensing is ineffective because there is nothing to be licensed. Well, I think we're, we are seeing some uh, movement from the new commission in order uh, to also uh, take legislative steps. Um, this is uh, Martin Pratt. Uh, you and also uh, um, members of the new commission have uh, uh, repeatedly pointed towards uh, this goal of uh, harmonizing certain exceptions. Now, uh, as we have uh, heard in, in the beginning in the um, intervention of Mr. Müller, there is also a demand by cultural heritage institutions for uh, more harmonization of uh, exceptions or of users' rights on an international level. So uh, since um, Mr. Juncker is, is aiming at uh, breaking down national copyright silos, does this also mean that the Commission will become more active on an international level within WIPO uh, to uh, ensure such uh, minimum standards for users' access to content or to works? I agree with uh, that content is... is uh, almost a derogatory term, and I, I do prefer works. So thank you. Yeah, the, pr the problem when we say work is that after that we say all oh, the protected subject matter. But yes, you're right. Work sounds better than than content. Uh, the EU member states have been very active as well at international level. Huh? I mean, uh, it will be 
it will be not fair to say that we have not been present and actively there in the ongoing, in particular, WIPO discussions. Up to very recently, occupied by the Marrakesh Treaty, but now discussions have moved to other subjects. There are discussions as well about the possible Broca's Treaty, and then there are discussions about limitations and exceptions for libraries, archives, education. And this is a discussion that has been ongoing for quite some time. Moving at international level is a different thing than moving at EU level. And anyone that has been involved in this kind of negotiations knows this quite well. To start with, because those that sit around the table come from very, very different backgrounds and legal systems, and you need to have a degree of consensus as to the objective. Once you get the consensus as to the objective, it continues to move very slowly, but you can get there. The Marrakesh Treaty was and is a very good example of that. That consensus does not exist at the moment in the discussions that are happening at international level, but that doesn't mean that people are not engaged. For instance, there was a remark saying we need a new instrument in order to be able to have limitations and exceptions in a number of countries where those limitations and exceptions don't exist. That is not the case. The current international instruments actually leave quite a large flexibility for the contracting parties of those instruments to decide in accordance with their national systems which are the limitations and exceptions they want to have, and to decide whether they want to update them in light of digital technology. So there is a lot of positive work that can be done at WIPO in order to have that discussion, and the European Union has been engaging also because, among other things, we have been thinking quite a lot as to the update of exceptions and limitations in light of digital technology. But it is a very different discussion also because, let's not forget one thing, and I hope I made that very clear in my intervention, one of the main reasons why we, as a European Union, intervene in legislation in copyright is the function of the internal market. That's our legal basis. When we put on the table of the Parliament and the Council a directive, it has a legal basis which is an internal market, which means what? We have an integrated system. We want to live in an area where you have not 28 different systems that cannot work, but 28 different systems that can work together or single systems depending on the issues we are discussing. And then, let's not forget as well, we do have a legal system that is integrated, meaning we have a court of justice, we have rulings from the court of justice, we have the possibility to have a harmonized interpretation of legislation. We can take infringement cases against member states when they do not comply with the law. We're talking about the regional integration project, which is very advanced and is very different from a discussion between over 100 plus countries at international level. One thing doesn't mean that the other one is not needed, but I think the discussions are very different. But there are, well, even though there is no single market on an international level, there are already quite a few copyright-related international agreements that the European Union is a party to. So I think the Marrakesh Treaty is sort of a new kind where we really have an international treaty that is not just taking the perspective of the creators and the creative industries, but also the interests of the users and users' rights. And I think this is a very good development. And I would like to ask one final question before we open the floor to the audience, because I think we should leave the last half hour also for a discussion with everybody. So I would like to turn to Mr. Ferrao, since in Mr. Keller's presentation, he has pointed out a lot of issues that still persist when it comes to the digitization and the making available of orphan works. So do you think that all these problems can be addressed with helping the member states implementing the orphan works directive, or is there also a need to revisit this directive in the coming copyright reform? Well, it's a good question. The orphan works directive, as Paul mentioned, is not 
the panacea. It itself recognizes that for mass digitization, other solutions are needed. However, the Orphan Works Directive should not be underestimated either. For the first time, the exceptions to copyright package was reconsidered, reviewed, and reopened, because, as you know, the list of exceptions is a closed one. On top of that, it was made mandatory and with cross-border effect, and it covers all types of material, audiovisual, visual, and text, et cetera. So in a sense, it was quite a groundbreaking instrument, but, of course, it has its limitations, and it self-recognizes that it has to be reviewed very shortly, after two years, I think. So in particular, to also extend its scope to photographs that, for the time being, stand-alone photographs are not covered. So it's a pioneering instrument, but showing the way that we need to follow. The problems, however, are also not just copyright-related. I mentioned the cultural heritage legislation, which also stands on the way of online accessibility to lots of cultural heritage material. So proper implementation of the recommendations of the Commission in this area will solve quite a few of the current problems, and I'm thinking about the out-of-commerce works. Out-of-commerce work is a big share of the total cultural heritage, because if you think that copyright lasts sometimes for over a century, so you will have most of the 20th century content probably out-of-commerce, let alone the 19th century one. And so for this type of content, of course, it won't be enough to have a work-by-work clearance system like the orphan works, but you have to rely on kind of collective clearance systems, the databases of rights information that were mentioned, and these schemes that are now already being implemented in France and Germany, for instance, for books, but hopefully also in the future for other types of material, because books, as Paul said, is just a fraction of the works we are talking about here. So in a sense, yes, a proper implementation, progress in implementing these recommendations is also contributing to solving the problem. Thank you. You raised quite an important issue that we haven't touched upon yet, which is that you're saying that a lot of the works that are still protected under copyright are no longer commercially exploited. So I think one of the many issues that as legislators we're going to have to tackle is also to look at the appropriateness of the current copyright terms. I would like to now open the floor to questions, and when you're asking a question, I would also like you to quickly state if you are representing an organization, and yeah, just raise your hand if you have a question, and let me know who you're addressing your questions to. Please. Yes, hello. I'm Dini from Wikimedia, the global movement that runs projects like Wikipedia, and my remarks questions go to Ms. Martin Pratt and Ms. Bergman. A copyright regime that prohibits the exhibition of 100-year-old letters and using pictures of public spaces is so far off the goalposts that it physically hurts. Yet instead of really talking about fixing that, we're talking about patches that, you know, database, Orphan Wars database and Arrow project are really patches that don't work. What we need is legal certainty. What we need is growing the public domain, and we can achieve that by harmonization and new exceptions. So here are my questions. I understand that you have 
economical interests, but would you at least support exceptions and limitations that grow the public domain without cutting into current monopolies? Thank you. Uh, so this is to uh, Mrs. Bergman and Mrs. Martin. Yes. Okay. Please. Uh, publishers are uh, supporters of public domain, and I'm I'm really uh, concerned when I hear that uh, cultural institutions who have public domain works are not willing them to make it uh, available as public domain works, but they're reserving the access because they have the physical ownership of the works. So if you ask me whether we support public domain, yes, we do. Um, and uh, I will go even further if we, and, and, and there I'm, I, I agree with Paul, I think that we need to find solutions for out of commerce. Yeah, it's surprising, isn't it? But uh, if, I mean, out of commerce, if we, I mean, there are works which are out of commerce and that the authors may not want them to be available on the Internet. And there you'll have to wait until the end of copyright. You may discuss the, the duration. That's another topic. But uh, uh, I think it's the author's moral right to decide whether their work should be available to everyone to see or not. But uh, provided that the works are no longer exploited by, by publishers uh, commercially, we're happy to find solutions because we think that this is, this is going to be good for us and, and for society at large. Don't know whether this answers your question. So do you support copyright reform that harmonizes the market? But it, it depends what I mean. It depends what type of reform. If we are to uh, find ways of encouraging the out of commerce MOU that we co-sign with uh, librarians, collective management organization, and authors, let's find ways of bringing it. I'm not sure that we have the same definition of a reform. So, but. Uh, so I'm not going to say what you want to hear, but in, let's find solution. I agree. Let's find solution. We need each other. If there are no longer uh, book publishers or music producers or film producers, uh, a number of works will no longer exist, and that will impoverish cultural institutions too. So we need to find a system that allows us to continue to have sustainability in production and in distribution. So almost everybody wants to uh, comment on this. So uh, uh, quickly, uh, Mrs. Martin Pratt, then Mr. Müller, and then Mr. Keller. But uh, please keep it short so we can have more questions. I can be very short because in the end, the question should not be whether I support a review of the copyright rules at the European level. It's whether Commissioner uh, Ansip, Commissioner Ottinger, and President Juncker support such review, and I think the signals have been made very clear uh, by Mr. Juncker to the European Parliament saying that he wants to review the existing copyright rules. So th those are the opinions that should be interesting for you. I just want to mention uh, everybody knows uh, what the Memorandum of Understanding of Out-of-Commerce work is. I hope so. Um, uh, this is um, made uh, on a um, voluntary level like a contract, but who of you knows what Germany made out of this contract solution? Germany made a law. It implemented the Memorandum of Understanding into a law in the Urheberrechtswahrnehmungsgesetz for the out-of-commerce work. So even events starting on a private law level, like a contract, a license, can result in a law. Um, yeah, I think we need to fix things on the European level and not only on the German level, though. But what I wanted to react to is um, what, what Anne said, and uh, like I'm, I'm happy to hear that my, my, my suggestion to look at this as complementary um, roles and not as opposing interests is already being taken up. And I, I, I just wanted to, to agree, like, for, for, for the purpose of, of brevity, I exclude what I usually say there. Of course, I agree that this shouldn't be like a right to publish everything which violates moral rights or something. We need to think careful about some kind of opt-out mechanism that allows people to say, like, I'd rather not have this published. Um, it can't be like if nobody publishes it, then everything needs to be available online. Um, so I agree with you, I guess, on that one as well. 
then we have a question over there. And if uh, somebody else would like to ask a question, please uh, raise your hand. Thank you very much. Uh, at first, I would say that uh, being uh, here as politician, really, I'm working in the academic field in research and reading for years and years. I'm from Estonia, from Tartu University. And uh, I am in contact with librarians, and they really have asked me that if I come to European Parliament, I will raise here the issue which have been talked here. Uh, the main issue, what they are saying, is this really the, the very harmful difference in tackling the book, the book as a book, and then the e-book as a service. That, 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 is a, that is a problem which is really very much harmful for, for whole, whole, say, preservation of reading as a culture practice. Uh, the numbers which are saying that four or six percent are using e-books, it's, it's, it's not because people don't like to read on screen, we have researched that, but namely because of these kind of very big differences and, and very big obstacles uh, in uh, dissemination of e-books, usage of e-books. And, and when we look at the, the fate of reading, I was really very much uh, harmed by, or, or the, the concerned when you said that, that nobody is interested in, in books, all are reading, uh, interested only in photos. Uh, th that is something which, which, uh, which is not true, hopefully. If we speak about users, if we speak about people, then I suppose that m the most people are still interested in reading. But, but the process of reading is, is really decreasing. If you look at the young people, they are reading less and less and less. And for that, I think that what we discuss here, to, to open up this process, it also concerns the, the, the all future of reading as such. Because young people, they're using all you know, the multimedia devices, they are not using books anymore, they are not looking at paper. And if we will not give opportunity to every young pe person to have all this culture heritage, which is in books, freely used by his multimedia devices, then soon, very soon, in coming decades, we will have young generation not reading anything, and our culture heritage will be lost. So my question is to commission. Uh, really, you said that, and we understand that's very, very, very difficult work. But here we see what was said in, in this Dutch working group, in the, the librarians' associations, there are priorities set. They are really urgent priorities. And there are, are different things which are also important, but there are a couple of things which are really important. It's the, the question about the book and, and, and service, that's a question of structural, uh, structural digitation, the, 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 the structural exemptions and so on. So uh, now looking at the six months time, what is said is, is now the, 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 can you say that in this six months time, Commission will come out with some solutions which could be practical in those really most prioritized areas which are really fatal for the, the future of the books. I knew I would get at some point to a question that I will have to remind what I said at the beginning, which is this commission has been in place for a week and a half. I can, I can express the commitment to, to review uh, the copyright rules and their functioning. I cannot say we will be doing X, Y, or Z, because this is something that needs to be determined at political level. But I think when you look at what we have been doing up to now, including in the public consultation, you have the type of questions that you're putting to us. Now, there are things we are not going to change by copyright law. The fact that, for instance, uh, people decide to read more or less or to read on the form of electronic books or to go towards access of content rather than ownership of content, uh, that is something we are not going to determine. Uh, these generations, next generations, and past generations have decided the way they want to read. You want to make sure that everyone that wants to read has the possibility to do it with the means they want to, uh, but I don't think it is for us to determine the market and how it will function. Uh, the issue of the book going towards the service is a very interesting one uh, that does raise a number of questions. Some of them uh, were uh, raised by Mr. Muller, uh, but I think what when we look at the copyright rules, we need to see how they function in the technology that exists today and need to make sure that it continues to function in years to come. But it's not for us to say, for instance, uh, you know, 
book should always be available in a physical format together with an online format. I will assume that if there is a demand to have that, the publishers and the libraries will take care of that. What we need to make sure is that the exceptions and limitations and the balance we want to find between the interest of the users, uh, the consumers, and the right holders, they function both in the offline and in the online environment. There's not always an easy equivalent there. Eh? It's not the same thing to say, I go and I get and borrow a book from a library than to say, I open my computer and I download a book from a library. So these are the things that we need to discuss going forward. Uh, as to which are the priorities in the end, I'm sure we're going to be uh, determining those very quickly, but they have to be determined at political level. If I may also comment on this from the perspective of a library user and also an e-book user, I think you make a very good argument for why libraries also uh, should be offering bestseller works, for example, because I think what, what uh, Mr. Keller was pointing at was not so much that people don't like to read, but rather that uh, an 18th century public domain book is probably not going to be the first thing to introduce them into using public archives. Like when I remember back to when I started, using libraries when I was uh, starting to go to school. Maybe the first uh, approach to library would have been to uh, lend out a popular book uh, that I had already heard about and uh, then to kind of explore a little bit more uh, the, the things that libraries have to offer. And I think we have to make this possible online and uh, this should include also uh, libraries being able to lend popular books and also for libraries to own the e-books that they are uh, lending out to people. I think um, we, are, we are facing a danger that young people are not enjoying uh, libraries in the same way that my generation was able to do this and uh, we also have to remember that not everybody is able to access a library physically so I do, uh, I do hope that the Commission will uh, tackle this issue and, and also improve the ability of libraries uh, to, to lend uh, e-books online, and I will also be supporting this from a, from a the legislative level. Can I just add something? Please. Just not, I mean, uh, this is not about whether a library should lend books or not. We all agree libraries should lend books. What I am concerned is when you say freely. Uh, is the uh, whoever funds the library ready to pay uh, the money which is necessary to sustain the ecosystem of publishing? If everything is free, then we need to find a way to pay the authors, the uh, directors of collection, the graphists, the translators, the, the, everyone who works in, in, a, in a publishing house, uh, the, 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 the bookseller. So this, and, and again, I'm not saying that there shouldn't be bestseller. I'm just saying that whether this is, should be the, really the objective of a library to, to, to lend bestseller or whether they should also try to push more difficult books. But uh, we need to find a balance because everything free, uh, it's everything valueless. And there are still people who are uh, 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 who, who need to be paid because they need to make a living in, in doing those, those uh, different jobs. So um, we just do need to find a, a balance. Uh, and I just want to close. You know what is the print run of a book in French-speaking Belgium? So that's the average number of books sold in Belgium of a fiction book. It's 500 copies. 500 copies. And those are good books. Those are books that people should read. There's a couple of bestsellers who are doing much better. But 500 copies, that's what is, I mean, you can even not sustain an investment. So when you have a bestseller, you want to be able to take some of the money and, and reinvest in those cop books that only sell 500 copies. And so we are just asking to have a system that works, that is balanced. Uh, okay, Mr. Müller would also like to comment, but I have at least three more questions from the audience, and we have ten minutes, so I would like you to uh, keep it brief. 
I'll do so. Please have a look at your National Copyright uh, Act and count the number you read the book Remuneration. There's a lot of them, and most of library activities like lending are remunerated with money, and the money goes to the collecting societies and then to the publishers, the authors, and so on. It's not for free. <laughs> Uh, we have a question in the back. Thank you. I'm Olaf Stokmo from IFRA. Uh, and, of course, Anne has a point uh, in distinguishing between the intrinsic uh, value and, uh, the, uh, and the, uh, the other value. Because, uh, like Van Dyck uh, said, uh, he, he, was a, he is a creator of music. He said that uh, in 40 years ago, I could uh, write a song with Ringo Starr and it brought me enough money to buy a house and a pool. Today, it will 100,000 from Spotify would bring me $80. Uh, my question was, uh, and comments go to uh, Paul Keller, whether you could expand a little bit, because when you said uh, that uh, you were asking for solutions, and uh, I was listening carefully to it, then it seemed to me that the solution that you described was exactly the solutions that have already been de uh, developed uh, in the form of a memorandum of understanding, in the form of other instruments that the libraries uh, and the authors and the publishers and the collectives have developed together. It seemed to me, also having heard from him, that the problem is not that solutions are, uh, are not available, but the solution, that the solutions are not used. I don't know when, uh, whether Munda, uh, Mundaneum has used or have been aware of the Memorandum of Understanding on Auto Commerce Works, uh, which was also the one that uh, Paul Keller uh, focused on. I, don't, uh, I know that uh, in several countries they have started using it. Germany has been mentioned. Uh, France has been mentioned. Several other countries in the Nordic countries, and it works well. We also know that someone has tried to do it without involving authors, publishers, and the collectives trying to bypass it. It hasn't worked, and it hasn't worked simply because they hadn't, haven't worked in collaboration. So the question uh, is whether it's not the, uh, the whether the, what is lacking is the marketing and sort of the dissemination of these solutions rather than developing new ones. Because what I have heard here is that, again, from what we have collected in the past, is that the main problem, problem is lack of knowledge, lack of money, and technical problems. If I may just one, have one comment to hide down, a uh, very short one. Uh, it's also in the developing countries and also the, the problem is not lack of exceptions. Uh, the study was made by WIPO, uh, by someone who's very close, as you know, to the, to the library community, and he discovered that there was, out of the 140 countries that he surveyed, 129 had multiple exceptions. The problem is that they are not implemented. And again, the, law, the, the question, the solution is not new legislation, new exceptions, but it's simply to make use of the solutions that we have. And on there, I also note that uh, Commissioner Oettinger has said that the solution forward is stakeholder consultation. Um, briefly, um, the, we, we are in the European Parliament here. Um, the European Parliament makes laws. It doesn't make backroom deals, which the Memorandum of Understanding in the end is. There's a group of privileged stakeholders sitting together and seeing how they can arrange a system that will keep those stakeholders who profit from the current situation in place and in control over the situation. I think the thing or the situation I've tried to outline is saying like copyright does not work if there is nobody wanting to license. And I know that the institutions that you represent are very willing to also issue licenses for or, or other legal instruments for works that you do not represent, where the authors have simply disappeared. And I think that is a, a, a possible solution as well in, discussed under the, the name of extended collective licensing or such. But I think, and that brings me back to that thing about the fundamental change, we are witnessing something here in, in our lifetime that will fundamentally change how humankind interacts with information and trying to 
somehow patch a system which was developed when you needed to bring, and I've seen these things at the headquarters of Sassam in Paris, when you needed to bring a title by horse and by boat from London to Paris to, um, to ensure that somebody had the right to collect, to collect a copyright fees for the use of a work, that is a time when we, when we developed this system, and there's good reasons why at that point, like you had a thing, the rule is that you need to give permission, and if you don't have permission, you can't use it. I think we've, 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 we've had enough progress to be, that we should be able to fundamentally question if the set of rules that we've given ourselves is still adequate for a fundamentally changed society, which will be fundamentally different from everything in the past for years to come, probably decades to come. And I think this is a house which makes laws, and if we understand something like this <coughs> as fundamental as a shift, then we shouldn't fix it by a memorandum of understanding which is like negotiated by a couple of people who happened to be there at the point when it was negotiated and not by our elected representatives. I have uh, two more questions already noted, and we're running out of time, so I will see if we have uh, time for the third one. Um, we had a question here. So my name is Vincent Bonnet. I'm the director of EBLIDA, the European Bureau of Library Association. And we are seeing at the moment the development of legal uncertainty with libraries, uh, especially if we look at the Darmstadt case in Germany that Harald Müller could explain about that, and the e-lending case in the Netherlands. So... With the development of court cases, this means that legislation is made outside of the normal legislative process. So I believe it's very important that the EU Commission tackle with this, the issue of legislation and find a solution for a copyright reform that benefits all of us. And uh, with the current patchwork in the copyright legislation throughout Europe, we also see some cultural dumping or social dumping with different rights for different users in different countries. And we don't believe that this is helpful for the European single market and for the European users to have different rights where, when they live in different countries. So my question would be to, um, to Maria Martin for the Commission and also to Anne Bergman, how they think we can reduce these differences between different countries and this cultural dumping to have a greater single market. And I would just like to make a, a, a very quick uh, remark that um, the Federation of European Publishers in its manifesto mentioned that a book is a book, whatever is the format. So I believe that in that case, maybe it would be possible to have seamless rights for e-books than for books. No, I think, um, I think the, the point as to uh, we have a patchwork in terms of... Uh, implementation of exceptions and limitations is correct. It's absolutely uh, the case. The origin is, is very obvious. You do have a list of exceptions uh, and limitations in legislation, which most of them, not all of them, are optional. Number one is you may decide whether you implement them or not. And you'll be surprised as to certain exceptions not being implemented in certain countries. Sometimes it comes in a very counterintuitive manner. Uh, the UK only a few months ago implemented an exception for parody. We will have all assumed that parody and the UK went together. I think the Netherlands still does not have an ex uh, in the right manner. Eh? Please do not, don't misunderstand me. <laughs> parody meaning house of very good parody being in the UK. Uh, if, if my information is not correct, I think the Netherlands you see do not have an exception implemented for the purposes of research. So there are there are a number of member states that basically have not taken advantage of the room of maneuver that was left in the InfoSoc Directive. That's number one. Number two, some of those exceptions are awarded in a very general manner, and that allows even when member states decide to implement them, you can implement them to a maximum or to half or to a 20 percent or with very different conditions. That is also uh, something that I think uh, contributes to that patchwork uh, situation. Now, is the solution that then we need to make everything and harmonize everything? Uh, again, this is subject to, to political decisions, but I will say uh, probably the important thing is to focus on those limitations and exceptions that we believe have 
an important value in terms of public policy objective and also important for the functioning of the internal market. You can leave member states after to maintain their flexibility for other things that are not going to be necessarily crossing borders. What we need to see is those that you think we need to have a common understanding on a higher level of harmonization so the rules are similar and that also helps the cross-border internal market element that I was referring to. Can I just briefly ask if you would consider those two I particularly highlighted among those, the ones benefiting archives, libraries, and museums? Yes, I would say that all of those that you see we have put for the public consultation are those that we thought we need to have a discussion about that. I will not want you then to misinterpret my words and say, therefore, the view of the Commission is that we need to do something, but at least that there is a need to have a discussion on those that you mentioned, on the e-lending that was mentioned by Mr. Mueller and others. That's why we ask about them. You will not find questions here as to, I don't know, exceptions for the use of broadcasters or broadcast in jails, which... Yeah, uh, with all due respect for the importance of the exceptions, but I think it is important, but th that is part of, 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 of the InfoSoft Directive. Uh, I think we have tried here to identify and discuss those that could have potentially an effect for the internal market. Um, well, I, I think that we, try, we believe that this um, disparity of exception within the framework of the 2001 Directive do reflect the cultural tradition. And I'd like to return the question. If we were to harmonize some of the exception, would you harmonize the remuneration? Uh, are you aware that for uh, analog uh, lending of books in Spain, the uh, Spanish government has awarded 100,000 euro for the entire Spanish kingdom? Uh, for authors to uh, collect. That means that the collection is, is virtually impossible because it means that each municipality is going to be invoiced 40 euro. In other country, only the national authors get the money because uh, the remuneration can, is not being uh, foreseen under copyright law. So um, there, there's a, maybe a very good reason why the member states are implementing exception uh, to copyright law differently. And uh, we have already offered to, to you, uh, I believe that together with the authors and, and our colleagues, booksellers, we're more than willing, and I'm sure that IFRO would agree with us, we're more than willing to go and see the government together and say that uh, whenever there's an exception and a remuneration, it has to be fair and it has to compensate the uses which are being done. So the offer is, is made again. Okay, we have uh, time for one last question over here, and then we have to come to a close. Hi, I'm uh, Rubrik from Young Pirates Europe, and uh, I have two questions, actually. First, I want to say that I love reading. I love books. I always have as a child. But I also know that among my peers, I am in the minority. A reason for this is because there's a huge barrier of entry to reading compared to other media. And I was wondering if there's any way that you think we could alleviate this. And the second part of my question is uh, books are a physical medium, and we can see that the physical media, physical media are fading, and they are com being completely uprooted by other initiatives like Netflix and Spotify, the streaming model. And, uh, well, I think books are going to do, uh, have to go this way as well. Um, well, I was wondering what you had to say about that. Is this the question to all panelists? Uh, yes. Okay. So... Um, can I... I, I, first of all, maybe let me correct that thing, my, my previous statement that people are not interested in books is based on what we're seeing at Europeana, for example, in the server logs, that people are much more interested in audiovisual content than they are in books. So it's like if you, if you offer like a broad variety of things, people tend to click on the pictures first. That's what my statement is based. Secondly, I think, as Maria pointed out, like, I don't think it's the role of copyright law to, to, to actually steer the marketplace towards what, in what formats people consume. Um, I think what you're saying, and I, I tend to agree with your, um, your expectation here, but I think it, is, it underlines the importance of being technology neutral in whatever comes 
as the next version of copyright law so that we're not stuck like 10 years from now with the um, current equivalent of um, maybe even e-books as we know them today will not be that relevant anymore or um, maybe they will be like the, the technological requirement of the dedicated terminal that's now in the, in the copyright directive. So I think it's a strong argument for trying to be as technology neutral, thinking about roles and what we want to achieve and um, um, move from there. Okay, we have three more minutes of uh, interpretation, so uh, really quickly, I mean, yes, it's a real challenge for the 21st century to have more people reading. When you look at the number of hours people spend in front of the television, I wish that they would devote some of it to read. Uh, we, we need to make, uh, I mean, to bring the books to the kids who are going to be the next generation of reading. And to answer your question about streaming, there are increasingly uh, uh, services offering streaming of books. Uh, at the moment, you know, uh, uh, most people read max, I mean, an average uh, two books per year. So you wouldn't uh, uh, have a streaming service if you only read two books. But this might be a, a solution for the big readers. We're developing them. There's a, a very good service now open in Spain and in Germany called uh, Scooby. It's ebook in reverse. I recommend that you go and see it. Yeah. Of course, we have uh, to uh, consider that we are in the middle of media change. Um, uh, that means streaming techniques will uh, maybe become more and more acceptable in society, not only for uh, movies, TV, Netflix, Spotify, for music, uh, maybe for books too. Um, the first thing I think is audiobooks, and of course uh, the uh, uh, memorizing institutions like libraries have to uh, recognize that and they have to react that. But we did this in the past. Uh, we were the first to, to accept uh, digital uh, formats, and uh, I think uh, we will do that in the future. And copyright law has to react on that. Copyright, copyright law has to develop um, parallel to the technical development. So, and we are for that. Um, very short. Yeah. Thanks, uh, uh, Julia. Uh, now, just uh, take this point to uh, um, uh, sell my fish, in a sense. Uh, so, uh, indeed, uh, I, I don't think people uh, are not reading uh, so much or are spending too much time on TV. Actually, they are not uh, spending so much time on TV either. They are spending their time on tablets and, and smartphones and all kinds of portable screens. And uh, if uh, we don't manage to get our cultural heritage content online or works, uh, then uh, others will take this uh, uh, up. And uh, uh, the visibility of uh, uh, Europe's cultural heritage will be uh, less uh, in a worldwide uh, scale. So uh, I, I, I think uh, it will be useful reading for uh, everybody uh, in the room. Uh, recital 6 in the recommendation, which shows uh, that uh, the issue is not just about books, it's not just about uh, money or remuneration, it's also about visibility, web vis visibility of uh, culture. Okay, um, uh, I would like to close on this uh, part, uh, point that was also raised because, uh, well, as a Pirate Party MEP, I was uh, elected uh, by people who are uh, looking at the user's perspective, and I think part of uh, the solution to the problem you're describing, uh, there's also the responsibility of publishers uh, to keep the technologies you are using open. And, uh, in the very beginning, you were referring to uh, the the title of our, uh, or the, the title poster of our event today, that the publishers are not always the Goliath. And I think this is very true when you're looking, for example, uh, at uh, the ebooks distribution by Amazon. I think uh, when publishers are using digital restrictions management, for example, they run the danger of putting themselves into a situation of becoming 
uh, dependent on a particular vendor of, uh, of some, uh, a product like uh, the Amazon's Kindle. So I think for users to be able to keep being interested in books, it's also very important that they can transform the books and uh, read books in every way that is uh, uh, suitable to them and not to be locked into a particular device. So also keeping the technology open and making sure that we approach these copyright issues through law and not through technology is a, is a very important point for the Pirate Party. Now, uh, I would like to really thank the interpreters for sticking around a little bit longer, and I hope uh, since there are still questions from the audience that we could not address uh, that the panelists stick around for the, the sandwich lunch that we have arranged. So if you have further questions to us, you're very welcome to ask them outside. And I would also uh, like to point out that uh, we have only briefly touched on the issue of the Marrakesh Treaty. There is an exhibition um, over uh, towards the exit of uh, uh, where you can um, experience uh, the way that a visually impaired person is uh, accessing websites and uh, things on the Internet. And I think this is also a very interesting exercise that uh, uh, brings uh, some of the issues connected to the Marrakesh Treaty closer uh, to issues.